Morning, Glory America. Bonjour. Hi, Canada. It's Hugh Hewitt. Bad news Friday, I'm sorry to say. Well, let me begin with a little bit of good news. If, um, if you're a podcast lover, yesterday's two podcasts of the interview with Hugh Hewitt, one with Dr. Francis Collins, the leader of NIH, National Institute for Health, and one of the most, uh, I think, high-profile science Christians in America, maybe the world, has already had a 1,000 downloads, and that's not even close to the number of downloads that the interview with Hugh Hewitt and the Josh Hawley interview from yesterday, Senator Josh Hawley has written a new book called The Tyranny of Big Tech, has received. And so if you missed either of those interviews live, and you couldn't have heard all of it with Josh Hawley because it continued for half an hour after he left the radio show, I suggest you go over to iTunes, the interview with Hugh Hewitt, and get them both and listen to them both. They made a lot of news. I'm glad there is uh, simply no better format than the long form interview with people like Dr. Collins or Senator Hawley on topics of extreme importance like the vaccination, its safety, the ability of public health officials to increase or decrease confidence in the United States vaccination program and Senator Hawley's very important critique of big tech. So all you have to do is Google the interview with Hugh Hewitt and iTunes, and you'll get there, or Spotify, or Stitcher, or anything. They're always collected at Salem Podcast Network. Biggest story of the morning is bad news, and I will talk later today with Senator Marco Rubio about this. The U.S. could return to the 2015 nuclear deal with Iran in weeks, a senior official says. Now, I'm thinking my spidey sense tells me that's probably Wendy Sherman. Now, remember, Wendy Sherman is the Deputy Secretary of State, uh, negotiated most of the first JCPOA. She negotiated the disastrous 1994 deal with North Korea on nukes. For Bill Clinton, she has been, she's a wonderful person. I mean, I enjoy talking to her. She has no more business representing the United States than I do flying the space shuttle. That's the bottom line. She knows no more about great power competition and the ruthlessness of communists than I do about parachuting from 6,000 feet in a low-flowing helicopter. They're about as dangerous to the individuals involved. In the case of me, it's me. In the case of her, it's the United States. This in the New York Times is a disaster. Uh, I love this. The tax package is in such trouble, the Joe Biden massive tax package, that they are floating the idea that if we raise taxes this much on high earners, they'll give more to charity. Because in order to avoid the disastrous consequences for small business, farms, timber companies, people whose houses have increased radically in value over 30 years that they've been living in them paying off their mortgage, their heirs won't get anything. Everyone will get taxed to death. He said, don't worry. They'll just give them, that on a call with Deputy Director of Mr. Biden's National Economic Council, David Kamen, he said, look, it increases the incentive to give to charity. Well, yes, it does. But first, people give to their kids. Honestly, the Biden people have no idea. Isn't Biden's infrastructure moonshot a big question, asked the Washington Post. Can the nation still achieve its highest ambitions? Now, the rundown usually concerns itself with factual issues and, and hard-hitting fact stories, etc., the first segment of this show, and sometimes the second, as uh, uh, it will occasionally happen on the on the Hugh Hewitt Highly Concentrated Hugh podcast, same place that you find the interview with Hugh Hewitt, you'll find the day's show concentrated down to its essence. Uh, the, this is not. This is a soft story by the Post uh, cheerleading for the infrastructure package, the $2.3 trillion that they want Joe Biden to spend on infrastructure. It's a moonshot, they call it. No, it's not. It's, it's pouring more money on the inflationary fire. Just remember that, just remember that, just remember that. The chair of the SEC testified yesterday on meme stocks and market structure. Gary Gensler, and this is a pretty good appointment. He's talking about the gamification of the stock market and that um, watching a movie based on a streaming app might lose a couple of hours of your day, but following the wrong prompt on a trading app, however, could have a substantial effect on a saver's financial position. He suggested it may be new time, time for new rules on the practice. Bravo, the Robin Hood generation, not a good idea what they're doing with stocks. Simply not a good idea. There's a wealthy lobbyist behind the gang gang in New York. Now, I like Andrew Yang. I kind of hope he wins unless the Republican from Staten Island wins. We'll get closer to that as we get closer to the runoff there. But it turns out a fellow by the name of Bradley Tusk, a powerful New York political strategist, lobbyist, and venture capitalist, is pouring dollars into Andrew Yang's campaign like you wouldn't believe. So special interests are behind Andrew Yang. It was Mr. Clean in the last presidential election. No coverage, no coverage. 
little bit, little tiny bit of coverage in the New York Times today. We'll see how long that lasts. The New York Post should be asking, what does he want? Why is all the money there? Texas lawmakers joined Florida lawmakers this week in voting election law reforms to increase election security. All the usual suspects are outraged. The same suspects that were outraged in Georgia and a couple of, and they're on the left-wing groups. This time, however, Coca-Cola is keeping its head down and Major League Baseball is not saying a word. Major League Baseball has been badly hurt with its fan base by yanking the All-Star game out of Georgia and deciding to become a blue sport. Now, I'm still watching the Indians sweep the Kansas City Royals. First time since 1960, they've done so in Kansas City, which is a great thing. They're atop the Central Division in, Amer in, the, uh, Central Division in the American League. And that's all good. But I'm not buying any Indians gear. I'm not going to any Indians games this year. And I don't think I'm alone uh, because of Rob Manfred's idiotic decision to involve himself in a 50-50 issue over uh, elected representatives' decision to make sure that voting is strong and structurally intact. And the Florida Governor DeSantis, the Texas Governor Abbott, are both out there and joining um, the Arizona Governor Doug DeSantis and other Republicans saying our elections are going to be free and fair. And if people have concerns, we will make sure those concerns are addressed. We are representative bodies and we are not run by the New York Times or woke corporate America. Good on Texas. Good on Florida. Meanwhile, Facebook continues to suffer the burn back from the ban on Donald Trump. Their so-called Supreme Court, the Oversight Board, which I talked about with Mark Zuckerberg last year at this time, which I talked about with Josh Hawley yesterday on the interview with Hugh Hewitt with Josh Hawley. We talked at length about the Oversight Board. It's a fig leaf. It's been burned away. It's kind of a silly thing. They should pull it up by the roots and get rid of it. But the British Telegraph, uh, the leading conservative newspaper in Great Britain, has a story today. Nick Clegg's PR heat shield for Facebook is a failure. What do you expect? The guy couldn't even get close to being prime minister in Great Britain, and he's supposed to be able to turn American opinion around about Facebook. Honestly, Mark, if you're listening to this, and I suspect you are, uh, do the right thing. Kill the oversight board. You know, innovate. And when the innovation doesn't work, don't be captive to sunk costs. The oversight board, all that you invested in it, it's a sunk cost. Simply announce it's not doing its job. Americans don't want 15 foreigners and four liberals plus Judge Michael McConnell trying to decide Facebook's problems for it. It's on you. Appoint an internal board. Get some smart people. You're a smart guy. This does not work. This does not work. Get rid of the oversight board. Good news. Referred to in Dr. Francis Collins in yesterday's the interview with Hugh Hewitt with Francis Collins. Here's the, uh, the story that he hinted at yesterday. Pfizer vaccine. 96.7% effective at preventing COVID deaths, according to a large study in Israel. That is great news. Now, speaking about the vaccine, we are debating in the United States, I'll ask Marco Rubio later today, whether or not we ought to waive patent protection so that India and other hard-hit countries like Brazil and in Africa can simply manufacture the Moderna vaccine and the Pfizer vaccine. Angela Merkel came out and rejected that. She's a creature of big German pharmacy, Bayer. Uh, I don't believe we owe Big Pharma a dollar since Donald Trump bought those vaccines through Operation Warp Speed. And anyone on the left saying, no, no, Pfizer didn't do it. Didn't you see the statement? I tell you, Operation Warp Speed, as Dr. Collins said yesterday in the interview with Hugh Hewitt, is responsible for those vaccines. Donald Trump's name is on every vaccine shot. No one in America believed it could be done in 11 months. We got it done through massive subsidies in some cases and massive guaranteed contracts in others. We being the American people, we own it. If they take a loss, we should help the shareholders out a little bit. But those are American inventions, like saying the Apollo moonshot belonged to, to uh, General Dynamics. Europe's vaccine campaign is accelerating. Expect to catch up to us in July. And yet we want to be more like them. Here's something. In Iraq... The Islamist fundamentalist Shia cleric Muqtada al-Sadr, who is responsible for the death of many Americans, nevertheless got the vaccination and got publicized doing so, which is a great thing for the vaccination. Bad news. Shin Bet, the FBI equivalent in Israel, has announced that the terror group, the uh, Popular Front for the Liberation of Al Palestine, bilked millions from European aid donors. They tricked them. They just tricked them. Look, deal with terrorists. That's what happens. They don't really play above board with your money. That's the rundown. Lots more coming up. Don't go anywhere, America. Hour three is Marco Rubio. Today we did the uh, Hillsdale Dialogue on Wednesday in order to clear a space for the senator from Florida 
who is on the uh, Senate Intel, Foreign Affairs, and Appropriations Committee. Stay tuned to The Hugh Hewitt Show. Welcome back, America. That music means we're joined, maybe from federal prison, by Sonny Bunch, the official movie critic of The Hugh Hewitt Show. Yesterday on Twitter, Sonny Bunch revealed that he was out to uh, capture some condors to nab the big birds. And I had to point out to them under Section 9 of the Endangered Species Act, every incidental take, which includes the intent to injure or otherwise disturb an endangered species, carries with it up to a year in jail per incident. So I think Sonny's serving uh, 10 to 20 uh, if his plan came off. Good morning, Sonny Bunch. Are you free man still? Uh, Hugh, for the record, I was calling for reforms to the laws. I said this is a thing that should happen. You know, but we should set the stage here because this is a it's an interesting story. The the uh, this 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 came up because a woman in San Francisco uh, has had her house, her her deck, her property, her life really destroyed by this flock of condors that has come and just settled on her on her property they just you know they're 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 pooping everywhere they're just tearing things up they're just destroying her property and what i said on twitter and i think i'm right on this i don't think anyone's going to really dispute that i'm correct here is that if an endangered species shows up on your house and starts destroying your property you should be allowed to do whatever it takes to defend yourself and your property and oh, that sunny. includes wiping oh, sunny. out the the awful invasive species that has attacked you. Uh, How naive! Space, How naive! California condor, uh, or if it was if it was a roaming pack of of panda bears that was just going around the neighborhood, destroying people's homes and and ruining all of their stuff, you should be allowed to you know turn them all into rugs. I think. Oh, that's totally Sonny, unfair. what you don't know is that during the 35 years of my assemblage of my broadcast empire, I was also an Endangered Species Act lawyer, and the Delhi Sands flower-loving fly, the Stevens kangaroo rat, the uh, the California condor, in fact, on behalf of the Tahone Ranch, and many other, the tiger salamander, you name it, I worked on it. They put my kids through college, so I know these, these pesky <laughs> little critters, and I know that what you are proposing does not, in fact, affect the steely-eyed enforcement police of the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Well, they may come yeah. at you for even speaking this, but uh, lo so long as it's <laughs> merely a recommendation, we don't have to worry about it. We can get to the Wrath of Man. Yes, Wrath of Man. We've got we've got a movie back in theaters. Only got a theaters. movie. <laughs> Wrath yeah. of Man. Uh, it is by Guy Ritchie, uh, who is the director of Snatch, Lock, Stock, and Two Smoking Barrels. The Gentleman and other uh, such features. It stars Jason Statham, um, who starred in the first two of those uh, that I mentioned with uh, Mr. Ritchie directing. Um, Wrath of Man is an interesting movie because it is, it's a slightly different picture than the one that is being advertised. The, the movie, I think, that is being advertised is a little more lighthearted, action-y, Type fair. It's it's a movie more in in line with, again, Snatch or Lock, Stock and Two Smoking Barrels or Rock and Rolla, which is another Guy Ritchie, uh, Brit gangster movie. Um, uh, and it is it is not really like that. Uh, it, it's much more in line with the British gangster movies of the 1970s, movies like Get Carter, uh, starring Michael Caine, or The Long Good Friday, which is technically a 1980s movie, came out in 1980. Um, but The Long Good Friday, starring Bob Hoskins, uh, which which are darker and uh, a little more grown up and a little more mm, purposeful with their violence, uh, if I can if I can put it that way. So Wrath of Man stars Jason Statham, Jason Statham as this guy called H. He just goes by H. In this, uh, he is an armored guard, uh, an armored car guard who, uh, you know, when he's doing his training, doesn't seem like that hot shakes. He's he's not that great on the shooting range. He's not, you know, that great at driving the, the trucks around. And then in the midst of a shootout, he reveals himself to be a dead shot. He's a cold eyed killer. He's really good at this sort of thing. Um, and all of the other guys on the armored car team are going, looking around going, whoa, where did this guy come from? And it turns out, you know, he's, uh, he, he is trying to figure out who killed uh, someone very close to him in a, in a robbery uh, that had taken place uh, in, a, in an armored car uh, five months previous.
Now, so, I don't want to so, spoil too much of the plot. Yeah, I was going to say you're getting close here to spoilers, but go ahead. This, uh, thus far, yeah, you're still this, in trailer land. Well, this is, yeah, this is this is all stuff that's in the trailer. So I, I'm, trying, I'm trying to stay with stuff that's in the trailer. Um, the, the, the problem with this movie, so I, I actually like this movie a lot. It reminds me of, again, it reminds me of those, those 1970s British uh, gangster movies, but it also reminds me a bit of Ridley Scott's The Counselor, which is a, like, super dark, Super violent, super nihilistic. Frankly, uh, look at the drug trade and the 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 way that decisions made uh, early on can uh, impact people for the rest of their their lives. Um, I I like this movie quite a bit. Uh, it it has a few issues, and one of them is that the the perspective of the film keeps shifting. So it's when we when the movie opens, the movie opens with a single take shot of the inciting incident slash robbery uh, that takes place entirely within the perspective of this armored car that's getting robbed. And oh, so the trailer actually shot. doesn't spoil much at all because it's opening shot stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Well, oh, very is, good. Is, yeah. Yeah. So this is, this is the opening opening shot. We know that there's a, there's a crime that takes place, but the, the trailer spoils a little bit because the, uh, the way the shot is designed, uh, if I can talk about the actual art of it for a second, the way the shot is designed, it is designed to obscure and withhold information from the viewer. So we don't we don't know exactly who was killed. We don't know why they are killed. Um, and we, we just kind of learn that uh, a bunch of people have died in the course of this robbery, which is, you know, not usually the goal in a robbery. The, the goal is not to, to kill people in robbery. The goal is to get away with money, right? So it's, it's, it's a violation of that principle. So the, this, the shot is very interesting, and, and as the film progresses, we learn little bits more and more about how the robbery took place, what happened in it, who was killed, uh, what H's connection to all of this is. My, my issue with it is we, we start shifting perspective like this about every 30 minutes or so uh, until we, we settle on the perspective of the robbers. And doing this... It almost feels like a cheat. It almost feels like Richie is walking us through and trying to explain every little bit to us piece by piece instead of letting us, you know, kind of discover it on our own. I, I, I don't, I, it, you know, maybe this is just a fussy critic thing. Maybe it's, maybe it's just a fussy critic thing, and I, I might be, you know, over... Right, let me uh, bring this back to the viewer level. Uh, when, when you say Guy Ritchie, I think uh, of Dennis Farina as Cousin Avi with one of my favorite lines ever spoken in a movie. Anything to declare? Yeah, don't go to England. All right, so I think of that. I think of Pikey's. I think of the fast cuts. I think yeah. of funny. Is this yeah. got any of no. that? No, this is not funny. This is not a funny movie. Uh, this is not a... This is not a movie that relies on Guy Ritchie's kind of standard tricks, the rapid cutting, the uh, style of filmmaking. Wow. It is not, um, Why would he change? Not, well, you know, it's, it's good to change sometimes. It's good to change sometimes. You could, you could definitely uh, – I, I really like The Gentleman. I put it on my top ten list uh, last year. But it's definitely a movie that feels like it is – at the end point of Guy Ritchie doing Guy Ritchie things, there there's some repetition. There's some, uh, you know, they're they're just it's it's a movie that rely relies overly relies on visual tricks and tips. And right, so movie, you're making an interesting uh, was, point here. When when we got out of the last or we entered into the last era of stagflation, the '80s represented the new realism, or the, the mid '70s, the new realism coming into a full flood after it started in the '60s. And I've just been watching the Gangs of London, and it's as dark as dark can get. And so, if, if Guy Ritchie's going dark, that might be the same kind of descent for talented directors that we saw when the new realism hit full crest in the '70s and early '80s. Yeah, I mean, I think that I think that we may be getting into a period when people are, you know. A little bit, a little bit darker uh, at the movies. I mean, what, what, what is this a reaction against? Right, it's not really a reaction against Guy Ritchie movies. Though I could see him thinking, "All right, I want to make something that is very different for me." It's a reaction against the comic book movies. It's a reaction against the kind uh -huh. of lightness and and ease uh, and cartoonishness of violence of those movies. I mean, this is a very violent movie, um, and but it's never cartoonish. The the violence is brutal and to a purpose. 
uh, and not for the faint of heart. I mean, I, I would I would strongly again. I, I'm very curious to see what the cinema score on this movie is going to be. The cinema score, so cinema score is a company that uh, sits in theaters and pulls people as they come out of the movies. And what's interesting about cinema score is that cinema score uh, is is tend, the, the grades tend to be higher. They tend to be a little inflated because they're people who paid to go see the movie and people who pay to go see a movie. A, are choosing things that they think they're going to want to see, and B, want to like a movie. Nobody goes to a movie and says, I want to hate this movie. I'm going to, I'm going to trash it when I come out of the movie theater. Everybody wants to see something that they like and enjoy, right? Um, the, the big exception to this rule is when a movie is different than it is advertised. And this movie has been advertised as, I think, a little closer to a standard Guy Ritchie action movie. Yes, it has been. Yes, it has. Uh, There's yeah. a funny joke that Jason Statham says. I'll handle the next one. Quick question. Yeah. Uh, when I was your age and people would talk about violence in a movie, I would say, well, Sam Peckinpah, Straw Dog, set the standard. Is this that violent? It is It is definitely Peckinpah-esque uh, and wow. probably closer to, to Straw Dog. Or wow. bring me the head of Alfredo Garcia than like a wild bunch, which is again a little more cartoonish. Um, it is. It is. I mean, there 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 are scenes of uh, torture in this film that it's not torture porn exactly. It 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 just is. It is just. Well, forewarned like, is forearm. And are you writing about this anywhere, Sonny? Are you writing yeah, about it? Anymore? It'll be it, it'll be in my uh, my newsletter screen time. Uh, if you follow me on Twitter, just ask Buddy Bunch. I, I I'll, I'll tweet it out when it when it's ready. Um, uh, but uh, yeah, it, it it's it's a really interesting movie. And again, it's not a perfect movie. I have problems with the script. I have problems with the way that it reveals uh, the 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 secrets that it holds. Um, but it is, uh, it, it, and it is a departure for Guy Ritchie. So if you're looking for kind of a a, a whimsical yet violent and and caper type film, this is not exactly what you're going to get here. It's not a uh, caper. Either. It's not Brad Pitt going down in the third, but not going down in the third. Sonny Bunch on Twitter at Sonny Bunch. Do not miss him. Also, his podcast across the movie aisle. He's the official movie critic, and I think I've saved him for doing a long stretch inside Club Fed this morning by my advice on the Endangered Species Act. Morning, glory, America. It's Friday. It's Friday. It's Friday. I have a special treat for you. Back to back, Selena Zito. She'll be back on Monday, but this Monday we couldn't talk to Selena, so I asked her if she could come in today. Columnist extraordinaire for the New York Post and the Washington Examiner, our friend indeed with the Yinzer Report from straight out of Pittsburgh. Some people talk about straight out of Compton. We start to talk about straight out of Yinzerland. Good morning, Selena. How are you? Good morning. I'm well. I'm great. How are you? Well, the Indians swept the Kansas City Royals and are atop the American League Central Division. Unfortunately, the Pirates are among the worst teams in baseball, with only the Twins and the Tigers really worse than they are in the uh, in the American League and the National League. The Pirates are sort of on a group of three terrible clubs. I hope you're not too distraught. I mean, I've been distraught since 1992. I don't think anything is going to change. We had like a little bit of hope in 2013, but that was dashed away. Um, so, yeah. I'm Get ready for a long, long summer among the uh, Bucks because they're not any good. Uh, Selena, what is really good is your column. And I want to talk about, first of all, Braddock, Pennsylvania, really lost the lottery because they were almost in Ohio and they ended up in Pittsburgh. Number two. <laughs> They were, they were really screwed over by local, state, and federal government, but especially local government. And I want to emphasize when I would get so upset with local officials during my 35 years of lawyering, and I would say to them, do you not know the lives you're impacting, the jobs you are costing, the families you are hurting, the children you are disadvantaging? They would be indifferent and they couldn't connect it. Your story about U.S. Steel and its Mon Valley operations ought to be read by every local government pencil-pushing bureaucrat in the United States because it's a disaster. And the Allegheny County executive, that's the Pittsburgh County, who says he's blindsided, that's just a lie. They know what they yeah. were doing. Tell us the story. That is absolutely true. They, they, it, it, was, it was a lie. They knew exactly what they were doing. So U.S. Steel announced in May of 2019 that they were going to invest, going to invest in $1.5 billion in um, upgrading not only the Braddock Steel 
uh, plant, which is the Edgar Thompson plant. The plant is over 148 years old. It was Andrew Carnegie's first uh, steel plant. It's it's just a part of American history, along with the Claritin Works um, and and the Irvin Works. Uh, and these are three iconic steel plants, three steel plants that are left in the Pittsburgh area. And, and I mean, people were just thrilled with this announcement. And what happened in, in between then and now is that the health department, the Allegheny Health Department, dragged its feet in giving it permits. Now, I, I just as a, as a, as a, to show you how, how much they're so full of it by saying, oh, you know, it takes a long time. When Amazon wanted to, was going around and, and doing its dog and pony show and to all these different cities to see if they would, uh, you know, uh, be available to have their new plan, you know, the city was able to come up with these permits plus spent $14 million to try to woo Amazon, and they did it within two months. So it's it's a lie to say that you can't get the permit for fifteen dollar an hour jobs. These are jobs that pay between ninety and a hundred thousand jobs uh, dollars a year, and they are in our poorest communities. It's because they don't want to face the environmental justice activists who are constantly pounding at them in their bases. And so they just let it expire. So I, I got to tell people, if Selena actually knows of which she speaks, she knows about Black Friday in Campbell, Ohio, where the Campbell Steelworks were closed suddenly. She knows what happens when a steel plant goes down or a Coke facility or uh, any kind of smelting plant or copper weld or Republic Steel. And I'm out of the Steel Valley and Pittsburgh is a cousin of the Steel Valley. I cannot believe they let this happen. Uh, it, Youngstown is doing everything they can to get steel companies to reopen, do strategic steel, do specialty steel, do uh, fracking steel. They're trying to bring back these jobs because these jobs are extraordinarily uh, uh, good jobs and they're blue collar jobs and they are for life jobs if you get a billion and a half in. And Allegheny County bureaucrats killed a billion and a half and 40 years of jobs for Allegheny County. I don't, and by the way, I'll bet you they got pension. There's a book here, Killing U.S. Steel. There is a book here on the people who killed this plant, their cushy government jobs, their ridiculous desire to be uh, woke, and their decision to destroy families because they are responsible. You're the first person I've seen write about this, Selena. Yeah, I mean, they are responsible. And, and the ironic thing is, is that these, the, the, the $1.5 billion um, investment, and we're talking over 4,000 jobs, the $1.5 billion investment was to make the plants even more environmentally compliant. But, and by the way, they are environmentally compliant. It's just never enough. And the thing that really irks me is that you drive through Brad in Pennsylvania or Clarendon, or, or these places are poor. These are the poorest people, and, and, and what they're taking away these jobs for, for poor blacks and poor whites and, and, and giving them an opportunity to have good-paying jobs. But they're taking it away because they cannot handle the pressure they get in every primary um, uh, among the, uh, the environmental, uh, you know, the justice um, uh, base. And, now, and, let's and, talk and, about and, Rich Fitzgerald. I want to talk about the, the chief executive of Allegheny County. He's a Democrat. His name is Rich yeah. Fitzgerald. Is he white or is he black? He's white. And is he old or is he young? He's my, he's 60, 61. Okay, so how much does he make? Do you have any idea how much he makes a year? No, I don't, but he's already wealthy in his, in his, um, in, in, in his, his private sector. But yeah, he, um, I, I'm going to guess about 100000 a year. I would love to know what his know. pension benefits are. I would love to know the pension benefits of all those people in their cushy government offices who have never gone to work in the morning with the guys in the line. Neither have I, by the way. My brothers did during the summers, and I decided that's too hard for me. And all the dads of the people I went to high school did this, uh, and some of the moms, but mostly the dads did this. It's hard, brat breaking work, and they earn their pensions. And then a lot of these companies went BK and screwed them on their pensions. They went through the Pension Guarantee Benefits Corporation. And here I see Lieutenant Governor John Fetterman, left-wing Democrat, wants to be a senator, 
crying crocodile tears. Now, you were you were nice to him, Selena, but I'm not buying it. That's a Democrat-run state. They could have brought the hammer down on uh, on Fitzgerald, the Democrat who runs Allegheny County. This is a Democrat nightmare. It's Joe Biden's vision of green America. They killed these jobs. Yeah, they absolutely did. And look, when you're the lieutenant governor, you certainly have the ability to light a fire under a piece of paper that needs to go from one end of a uh, a, a file cabinet to another end of a file cabinet. You can make these things happen. They made this happen for Amazon. And they went out of their way, and they spent $14 million of the tax taxpayers' money to woo Amazon that was never going to come to Pittsburgh. Well, that's because they, they wanted working. football. Uh, but, you know, the Pittsburgh Steelers are iconic of Steel City, and here yeah. Steel City is is banishing the steel industry. Does this mean that those plants will close? Uh, you know, what, it, it, it creates a massive uncertainty because if they're not going to have these upgrades to make them environmentally compliant for the future, they are now, and you know each with each administration it's going to be worse, that essentially tells you we're not going to be here. You know, does Joe, as the president dispatch, you know, back, back when Pete Wilson was governor in California, he would dispatch so-called red teams when anyone's threatening to leave the state, and he would cut all the tape he would keep in there. Is Pennsylvania doing anything to reverse this yeah. decision? I mean, they, the governor ought to fire this Fitzgerald character and everybody who worked for him, uh, push him aside and say, we want you to expand. These are four, These are generational jobs. Anybody reacting to this? This is a big story, and you're the only one I've seen cover it. No, Tom Wolf would not react to this. He he's one of those big environmental environmental justice people. He didn't react when there were hundreds of jobs lost uh, of, a couple weeks ago in Roaring Springs, Pennsylvania. That's because they're very hostile to manufacturing, which is inc and, and Joe Biden hasn't hasn't um, reacted. And the steel workers. But he's from Scranton. He's from Scranton. Yeah. He's supposed to care about Pennsylvania. He's supposed to care about Pennsylvania. He's supposed to care about these steel workers. He certainly was, uh, he, he got their endorsement as the Steel Workers Union. It's, this is it. This is a great column, Selena. Has anybody in legacy media covered it? No. I mean, no. They're local press, but nobody in legacy media. No. Yeah, I, I think you got a book here. Who killed U.S. Steel? The left and the Democrats killed U.S. Steel. And with it, jobs for a generation for thousands of people who, uh, who could have grown an entire family and community off of them. Selena Zito, thank you, my friend. That column is, I just tweeted it out. Go read it. Send it everywhere. Democrats hate jobs. They want you to be dependent. They do. It's that simple. Stay tuned, America. I'm Hugh Hewitt. Morning, glory, America. Bonjour. Hi, Canada. Just had on Glenn Young and likely to win the Virginia convention tomorrow in the ranked voting system. By the way, you can't list Young and Young and Young or your vote will be thrown out. I got a note from a... Uh, a local Republican activist in Virginia said, don't tell people to vote for Yunkin, Yunkin, Yunkin. I didn't do that. I want you to just vote for Yunkin, not number two, not number three, not number four, not number five. Just fill in Yunkin on number one and turn it in. Uh, ranked voting is a nightmare in my view. But I'm joined by James Holman of the Washington Post, who just wrote a column about the Virginia primary. And I don't like your column, James. How are you, buddy? Your column is as bad as the twins. <laughs> Well, I, uh, I I am good, but I am sorry to hear that it was sad. <laughs> well, 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 welcome, you know, welcome to the world of opinion journalism, because that's what I say to opinion journalists. You know, I don't like this at all. You know, can you guess why I don't like this? Because I didn't, I didn't highlight Glenn Youngkin. <laughs> no, no, that's not it. I don't care if you, if you, but you began with Kirk Cox, who doesn't have a prayer of winning, and Amanda Chase, whose people are all listing Glenn Youngkin second. And then you throw in uh, Glenn as a wealthy businessman, one line, when in fact he's surging across the street with Ted Cruz and there's been one poll uh, and he's like double digits ahead. So, James, I just think it's important to lay out who's in there. You, you want to talk about a very good thing, which is if you nominate a nut, you're going to get... And none of these people are nuts, but if you nominate the most conservative person, you're going to lose Virginia. If you nominate Yunkin, he can beat Terry McAuliffe. I don't know why you buried your lead that the Republicans are going to nominate uh, a normal person who's going to win a good conservative. Yeah, well, I, th I mean, I think Yunkin and uh, Snyder and Cox could definitely win 
the general. And I think that that's there's this narrative now that Virginia has turned blue and Biden won by double digits. But the the history and the dynamics and the backlash, it's it's totally conceivable that if if Republicans nominate someone like Youngkin, uh, they, they, they can win and beat Terry McAuliffe in November. Uh, and, and why is that? Would you would you explain to people why Youngkin could win, for example? You know, I, look, yeah, I have I, got nothing against the other candidates, but I'm a Youngkin guy. I've met him. I know him. He will win in November. But why do you think he could win? Well, I think he, you know, he's, he has he doesn't have like a long voting record uh, in Richmond or Washington. Uh, he uh, in, has a, a profile that that could help him appeal in a place like Northern Virginia, where Republicans have obviously struggled for a while now. But part of the focus of my column was the Republican problem in Virginia isn't just kind of the D.C. suburbs. There are suburbs in other parts of the state where the, the swing has actually been more dramatic. So I focused on Chesterfield County, which is the suburbs just south of Richmond, where, you know, Craig Deeds, the Democratic nominee for governor in 2009, got 30 percent of the vote. And uh, and Ralph Northam won in 2017 the county narrowly, uh, the, the current Democratic governor. And so uh, I, I, Republicans are going to have to find a way to win back some of these suburbs. It's not just liberal D.C., uh, but around Richmond and Norfolk. And and uh, and someone like Youngkin is well positioned to do that just because he he wasn't part of the Trump wars of the last four years. Uh, he is the kind of you know Republican who can win in Virginia. What do you think of the rules for this? Thirty nine different places. And people, if you want to know where you can vote, you got to be a registered delegate. And people have registered. They know that they are. They just got to remember to go and find a place. There are only 39 polling places, but they're all listed at Yunkin for Governor. I'm sure the other websites as well. What do you make of all this? Well, that's so I think the reason that you're unhappy with the column is because I sort of tried to avoid handicapping or prognosticating the convention. I think it's kind of it's a mess. The ranked choice voting thing is impossible. You know, it's, it, you don't really understand who the universe of 50,000 people is. How many of the 50,000 ish people who registered are actually going to show up uh you know and so every campaign or not i mean the snyder campaign and the youngkin campaign all can point to data points that show that they have kind of a leg up but the the rank choice system adds a level of unpredictability here in the 39 locations and so i just think it's it, it the reason i sort of stayed back from trying to predict who has the leg up in the convention is that it, it feels kind of like it could end up producing some weird outcome uh no 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 james i love you you know that but that's not why i don't like your column i don't like your column because when people write about elections they should list uh the candidates who are all running without any kind of description other than the one that they've got listed on the ballot wealthy businessman is pejorative i i mean if i'm going to be a woke journalist i don't mean it as pejorative i didn't i, didn't I know but it, it, it is the classic you know woke uh, legacy media you're not woke you're like the least woke Washington Post opinion columnist out there. You're from Minnesota uh, and, and, you know, Stanford. Uh, do they even have woke people at Stanford? Yes, they do. In fact, that leads me to my second comment. So let's just wrap up. If you're going to make a prediction, who do you think is going to win tomorrow? I really don't know. That's what my, I really don't know. I, 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 you're, I think you're right that it won't be Amanda Chase or Kirk Cox, even though I focused on them, because I think the, the dynamic is revealing and says something about the state of affairs. I think it'll be Youngkin or Snyder. Well, there is one poll by that group that everybody loves, and they've got, they went out and found delegates, and they pulled delegates, and Youngkin's way ahead. So if you think it's going to be those two, one of those two, I, that's what I would have led. Now, Stanford, they canceled 11 sports, including women's crew. What is wrong with the red? It's terrible. It's, uh, it's outrageous, and I hope that they reversed that decision. One of my very best friends was an All-American wrestler at Stanford, and uh, uh, he's now in the Marine Corps, and he uh, he's very upset about it because wrestling is one of the sports they're getting rid of. Uh, and it, it's, it's all about profit and money, and it forgets the whole point of having these these sports. You know, one of the, the, one of the coolest things about going to Stanford U was that 11% of undergraduates are Division I athletes, and, you know, they're, and they're smart. And so, you know, it's not just like, oh, they got recruited to be on this team. You no, they're like Ohio incredible. State. They graduate. Right, exactly. Well, and they, yeah. they graduate and they, they add something. You know, I, I was never a good athlete, but they have discipline. You know, they're self-disciplined because they're training and preparing at a high level. You know, Katie Ledecky, the Olympic swimmer, went to Stanford. And 
and so you you have all these people who I think sports provide structure and, and they're around other smart people, the coaches, they really are student athletes. And I think you should encourage those pursuits. And uh, it's really disappointing that Stanford is pulling back on the places where, that don't make money uh, because they, they have enough money and it really is an important part of the student experience. Now explain something to me. How big is the Stanford endowment? Uh, I, I, I don't. After the markets have done what they've done, <laughs> it's probably twenty-five or thirty billion. Yeah, Harvard's up over forty billion, I think, right now. And if it they cut a sport, now. if they, if they yeah. cut a sport and said, "Oh well, times are tight," uh, I mean, I, I would just, uh, I, I don't give them any money anyway uh, because they got thirty-eight billion in an endowment. But Stanford's big donors should just say, "We're not going to build you a new faculty club." By the way, it's the worst faculty club in America, and they got all this money. Uh, you got to stay at the West and across the street. Uh, they built the stadium overnight, right? That's the, that's the famous, oh, let's tear it down and build the stadium again. It's not like it's a poor campus. It's a rich campus. Yeah. And it is, you know, I, I think one of the things here though, is that they're, the play is to like threaten that you're going to get rid of these sports and then hope that some rich donor who, you know, played for one of these teams steps up and it's, it, it feels almost like they're kind of trying to blackmail or extort donors to like give line item gifts and i don't like that approach at all well it's it's completely woke administrators and a completely woke university so i come back to wokeness has stanford lost its way in your opinion when it comes to diverse ideas and protecting freedom of speech i i you know it's, it's changed a lot since i was there and not for the best i like there i when i was there um, you know, it's just, it, you feel like you're on the edge of the country. I mean, you obviously <laughs> know California better than anyone, but you know, you, when you wake up at 9 a.m., it's already noon on the East Coast. And so it was, when I was there, it felt very removed from the kind of the, the, the DC East Coast thing. And I do think that there has been a change over the last decade. Uh, but I, I actually think it's much less woke than, than your Harvards or your Yales. I agree with that assessment, by the way. I do, because they've got the Hoover Institution sitting there in the middle of the campus, and they they bring in the media fellows every year, and they'll put in a lefty like John Martin from the New York Times, but then they'll bring in a righty like me, and that's fine. If you're going to mix up your media fellows, that's just fine. I'm sure you've been a media fellow, haven't you, James? Yep, yep. Yeah. So, you know, that's a diverse crowd. Totally. So yeah, they and, do... And, and the campus, I mean, the campus, Condoleezza Rice was the provost. I <laughs> mean... So it's, it's, there is there is a lot more support for intellectual freedom, and you know I, I do think that there has been pushback, you know the the kind of from I guess I would call it like the establishment faculty on campus against the the young activist liberal types. It's just, yeah, but the Hoover Hoover lost its way. They went left. Uh, yeah, Condoleezza Rice is there. George Schultz was there until his death. But they, they, they hired McMaster, which is great. The general is not political, but they've gone from being Reaganism. And Glenn, uh, uh, whoever Glenn's last name was, Campbell. to Glenn Campbell, to being a leftist woke, um, and as a result, they fired their head guy because he wouldn't hire any real conservatives. I think there's right. stuff to be done there at Stanford, James. I hope we get out there. But in the meantime, when when Youngkin wins tomorrow handily, I'm going to give you a rake you over the coals next week because uh, you you're an opinion you're an opinion columnist now, and I hope you try and defend the twins because that's really sad. Don't go anywhere, America. It's the Hugh Hewitt Show.